Thank you. And uh, we're being recorded for uh, YouTube. You're lucky, you're not, so <laughs> chill. <laughs> Hence all the, the microphone. Anyway, it's my very great pleasure today to wel welcome Marjorie, who writes at Maylin Bromfield. Is that right? Bromfield. Brom Bromfield. Get your name right. And Sue, who writes as Su Susan Leona Fisher. They have both, and they both write historical fiction. Uh, which, as you would expect, is, uses a great deal of research. You know, you're a very brave person if you suddenly write about the Tudors without making sure you've got your facts right, because your readers will pick you up in the greatest... You know, it wasn't like that. So uh, this is what we're going to talk. And just to start with, um, Marjorie is going to read a very short extract from one of her novels. Thank you. Sit back and enjoy. And I can tell you something. Hello everybody, this is my second novel, Mr Peeps and the Primrose Hill Mystery and the subtitle is Investigation London, Samuel Peeps becomes ensnared in a murder, mystery, a murder investigation uh, which most people don't know about Samuel Peeps, I didn't know. So I'm going to read you the introduction to, to my novel, <coughs> the author's introduction. On Saturday the 12th of October 1678, Sir Edmund Godfrey, a Justice of the Peace, left his London home and never returned. Five days later his body was discovered in a ditch at Primrose Hill, run through with his own sword. The mystery of his death has never been solved. But intriguing clues remain for aspiring detectives. Travel with me back in time to Restoration London, where we will visit the crime scene and meet the men who found his body. We will attend to the coroner's inquest and hear evidence from Edmund Godfrey's friends and neighbours who spoke with him in the hours before he went missing. Victimology is at the centre of any murder investigation and Edmund Godfrey may, as our protagonist, hold the vital clue to the mystery of his strange death. That fatal clash between the individual and his world. For the annals of history are full of such tragedies. To understand what may have happened to Godfrey, we must meet the man in his time and try to understand his world. So that you may get to know him, our journey begins 13 years before Edmund Godfrey died. We will meet King Charles II, a most amiable king who loves his dogs and his women, and Mr Samuel Pepys, who loves a good gossip in London's fashionable new coffee houses. He will soon become ensnared in an investigation. Gentlemen, wear a long curly periwig, a coat with great skirts and a sword. Ladies, you may wear a fashionable beauty patch in the shape of the crescent moon and a silk gown in the latest French style. But remember ladies, inside your muff, hide a pistol. For Edmund Godfrey has died in a time of great terror. There is a rumour of Jesuit plots to start a rebellion, cut Protestants' throats and assassinate King Charles. <laughs> but beware, in Restoration London you will confront a much late, greater danger than plots, pickpockets and cutthroats, a, a danger against which your swords, your pistols or even a blunderbuss will be useless. London, 1665, the plague year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. What, have I disappeared? That's better. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, I hope that sort of sets, sets the scene, as it were, for, for our discussion. And if I can pass on now to Sue, who's writing about a very different period. I'm going to read you the opening page of uh, Miss Deacon Investigates. 
we didn't um, agree on what we were going to talk about, but I've got the word investigate in there as well, which often goes to show, of course, that when you're writing, whatever you're writing, history, um, romance, whatever, having a little mystery and investigation is quite popular with the readers. Um, Miss Deacon is my own name for a real character who is waiting on the dockside at one of the ports in South London to take a ship to France in 1918 and to go to the Western Front with a particular task. She's a part of a committee of ladies and as she waits to board the ship, she recalls boarding another ship from Southampton 16 years earlier bound for South Africa, where she was also part of a commission of ladies. We are shepherded into a dreary room to await boarding. Everything is so grey, the now darkening sky, the dockside, our troop ship waiting beside it, the choppy sea beyond the harbour, and, as if in unspoken agreement at this unlooked-for departure, each of us appears to have chosen our drabbest outfit in which to travel. We will sail after dark and have been assured that the channel is well patrolled. I last set foot in France 16 years ago on my way home from the war front. Now I return to go rather too near another but not so close as the soldiers now marching past our window up the gangplank with their pinched white faces and permanently creased brows. Older men now, a lot of them. I glance around our small group. How little I know any of them with the exception of Mrs. Manningham, with whom I've worked before. The three other members of our little committee I've not previously encountered, but I do know something of them by repute and anticipate controversial discussions about them. conditions faced by women in employment and the growing role of women in trades unions. The two women clerks who are to administer the committee stand a little apart from the rest of us guarding the precious typewriter, which Mrs. Manningham insisted must be kept with the party. I recognise one of them from the Department of Labour typing section. It takes me back to my own role in 1902, when my much younger self, a junior civil servant, stood awaiting embarkation at another quayside. On that occasion, I was fulfilling Mrs. Manningham's present role as honorary secretary. It occurs to me that these two young clerical officers could work their way up the ranks of the civil service and eventually might in turn become members of an investigative, investigative committee for the army when the next war comes around in another 20 years. Begin and cease and then begin again. It seems we never learn. Thank you, Sue. That was that's very intriguing. The the mix of periods, if if you, if you like, from the Boer War, which of course was very deadly, so, and then, as you say, it all goes round again and and again. And and if I can start, really, my fir first question. Um, I know you write a vast array of books, which fair to say about covering about a hundred period, hundred years period from the Regency up to First World War. So what, what got you started and what, what inspired you to write about these, these periods? Well, it was this lady. She's called... Uh, she's called... Um, she would use the microphone so people can hear. She can't, can't get the stuff. <laughs> um, she's called Lucy Dean. Um, and she was a factory inspector in her 20s. Uh, in the 1890s and she had a background um, her father was in the military and she had lived in South Africa but she was asked to be secretary of a committee sent out to South Africa during the Boer War the Second Boer War 
um, because um, the British Army had been accused of um, very cruel behaviour towards women and children from the Boer population because there'd been a policy of burning the farms that they lived on and then gathering them into, and the British have been accused of being the first to invent these concentration camps where women and children were dying of disease, um, they were not properly fed, uh, the camps were in very poorly sighted places, etc. There'd been a lot of complaints. So as is its want, the British government set up an inquiry commission and Lucy went out as secretary. Um, and my, my interest in doing um, research on this period, I suppose, stems from the fact that I took an A-level in British political history at school. And it covered 1815 to 1914. And uh, I don't know how many of you have studied a history syllabus in your education, but it tends to be quite a lot of dates, quite a lot of men, <laughs> and, uh, doing things like going to war, um, uh, making policy in Parliament, etc. And, you know, the suffragette movement was growing at the turn of the uh, 19th into 20th century. And um, I was interested in, when I retired from paid work, as a hobby, really, taking up some research into periods that I knew a certain amount about, but not as much as I'd like to. And I vaguely knew that there'd been a thing called the Fawcett Commission, which had gone out to South Africa. So I knew Millicent Fawcett had chaired it, this committee that went out, uh, but I didn't know any of the other members. So I began to research. I joined the British Library. Um, I went to the uh, National Records Office. Um, I looked at various things. And in the end, I traced the main source of information about the committee to my friend Lucy. Um, to the Modern Records Office at uh, Warwick University. Now, luckily, I have, um, I've travelled around the country quite a lot in my life. And I had a friend in Kenilworth, so I went and stayed with my friend in Kenilworth, and I popped along to Warwick University and went through her, her records. And she kept a diary, she wrote letters home to her sister, she did official reports and correspondence, and it was all typed out. It was wonderful to read. Um, so I worked my way through these 1902 files and suddenly, oh gosh, there's one more file left, but it says 1918. Ooh, what's this? And I don't know if you find this, um, Marjorie, but it's very easy when you're doing historical research to get diverted. You see something that you weren't looking for. And, oh God, that sounds interesting. What's that about? And I opened up 1918 and there was this stuff about a committee of ladies being sent to the Western Front in 1918 of which Lucy was the chair now, and my Mrs. Manningham, who was actually Mrs. Markham, was, was the secretary. And they were going out to spend a week, going right up the Western Front, to investigate allegations that the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps ladies were having it off with soldiers when they didn't alter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that, 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 was, that started me on another journey, of, of which more later. Thank you. How do you beat that? Um, just as a coincidence, you to be mentioned women's um, trade unions in the 19th century. I actually wrote my dissertation for my degree on 19th century women trade unions, and it was incredibly difficult because what I hadn't realised was how little information there was. So it really was a question of scrabbling around in boxes looking for bits of paper. So thank you, uh, Marjorie. What what what? inspired you to start researching and looking at your periods? Right. Well, my interest in history began, like Sue's just said, I remember my first history lesson where the teacher was using the blackboard and telling us about people who used to live in caves. And my sister and I were so excited, I can remember us going home and telling our mother, we were about six, all about these people who used to live in caves. But my interest in um, my writing has been inspired by history lessons from when I was in the junior school because we, those of you who, who may be in my age group might remember the Usborne book, The Tudors and Stuarts, 
that we had in school. I can remember the smell of the pages, the, 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 the shiny pages with the, with the photographs. And I was just so inspired by the Tudors especially and the Stuarts, by the clothes that they wear and they wore and, uh, and all these interesting facts about Henry VIII and all his wives. Uh, so that is what, what I've always been fascinated by. So my interest in the Tudors and Stuarts began with a teacher in school. Thank you. My, my, and, and moving, moving on and uh, Pass, pass the mic microphone, um, Sue. So, so how do you how do you start your re research? You've already touched on, you know, you, you you travelled, but but thinking like your Regency books, and you've written quite a few of those. Just a few. Just a few. <laughs> how many is it? Sixteen. <laughs> Sixteen. Well, that's impressive. But but for those for the Regency, how do you start your research? Is it something that inspired you particularly about that period or you found a bit of research? Well, when I started looking at the um, Boer War, I had no intention of writing a single book. I was just doing it for interest. And then I think it might have been my friend in Kenilworth that she said, um, when I was talking about what I'd found out, what are you going to do with all this? How about writing a novel? So, so that's where the idea came from, I think. Um, so, I think that from, from my point of view, I, I, like a, I like a context of what I'm doing. So, um, if I am deciding to research a period in order to write a, a novel, um, I like to make the, um, the picture clear for myself. The pictures, actually, is quite... I like looking at pictures, I like looking at portraits, photographs. Obviously, when, in the Boer War, there were photographs. Um, and getting a structure, a kind of timeline of events, of people, of places, and then from that, um, my, in fact, if you, if you look at, I do it mostly on the computer now, but when I started, I was doing it on paper. And every single one of my books has got this thing, which is an A4 sheet, which has got that black ink down the left-hand side, showing dates and the key events, and who died and what book was published or whatever it might be and then down the right hand side in you can tell I used to be a teacher at Red Ink <laughs> <laughs> I would have things to do with my characters in the book so I would have a real visual I'm a visual person so I have a visual picture of how my the timeline of my story fits into the timeline of what was going on in society politics economics and so on um, and then um, when I started off, I did join a thing called the New Writers Scheme, and I got lots of feedback, um, uh, critical feedback, you know, as you do when you're starting something you thought you could do, it was easy and it isn't at all, and you have to learn the trade. Um, and I, I got um, I got uh, sort of better at, uh, at expressing the, I thought they called it drip feed of bits of history into my story, because the last thing we're supposed to be doing is giving a history lesson, you know, and if it comes across like that, unless the reader is particularly interested in that particular period of history, they'll, be, they'll get bored pretty quickly, because what you want is a plot with characters that, that um, the reader can identify with. Thank you. Um, Marjorie, what, what, how do you do your research? For both of my novels, the one about Samuel Pepys, and this one, Mayflowers for November, which is about Anne Boleyn. For both of those, that, that was, Anne Boleyn was the first novel. Both of those, I'd already done the research to start with because I enjoy he, reading non-fiction historical work. So I'd, I'd read several biographies of Anne Boleyn from Richard Starkey, um, Eric Ives, and etc., etc., Nora Lofts. And for Mr. Pepys, I'd read several versions of his diary, um, including from uh, second-hand shops, actually, I found very useful, where I got um, the Everyman editions from the 1920s and 30s, uh, which gave ev wasn't a shortened version of his diary, but uh, a full version of, of every 
everything that he wrote every day. So that, that I, I, the research that I needed to do for the novels was, uh, was ongoing research that I discovered something I didn't know or something I wanted to find out about after I'd already decided to write a particular story. Okay. Okay, thank you. And moving on, what, uh, so right, I shall give you back the microphone. Do you use websites? I mean, you've both said that you scrabbled around in boxes, looked in second-hand shops, looked, you know, gathered books in great detail. Um, but of course now we have some fantastic websites that come through. Do you use those now, or are you still books? Do you want me to? Yeah, please. For my novel about Anne Boleyn, Mayflies for November, I wasn't all that much into websites, but I did do a lot of looking up in Wikipedia. I got all the books that I needed um, for the everyday life of Anne Boleyn. Um, Lisa Picard, Everyday Life in Elizabethan London. Alice and Sim, Pleasures and Pastimes in Tudor London, England and the Tudor Housewife. So I got all the details I needed but sometimes if I wanted to look up a date of someone or to see what somebody looked like I would go on Wikipedia but in the 17th century when Prince was writing his diary has been described by one television program as the century that wrote itself and it, it obviously was and I needed quite a few websites to get primary evidence, extant primary evidence from, from, from Samuel Pepys. I mean, there's John Evelyn's diary that is, um, he wrote it all his life and he lived into his 80s. There's Samuel Pepys's diary, which he wrote for 10 years. But the following websites I found really useful. Archive.org for the bills of mortality from, well, throughout the plague and beyond books.google.co.uk uh, a collection of the most remarkable trials and th this was the trial of the men who died who were executed for the death of Sir Edmund Godfrey but also britishhistory.co.uk.org.uk British History Online the House of Lords Journal tells you a lot. There's Morgan's Map of London in 1682 and the Crown State Papers Domestic, which you can read from Charles II's reign. And if ever you look, want to look them up, it's useful to know that the, that the dates of Charles II's reign for the Crown State Papers are dated from when his father was executed not from the 29th of May in 1660 when he rode into, on his horse into London um, and became Charles II after he'd been restored to the monarchy. So there's the gazette.co.uk newspaper archives, v &A images which have images of a very interesting pack of cards from Stuart Times about the Popish plot and westminster.gov.uk archives which gave me the minutes of St Martin's in the Fields vestry meetings where Edmund Godfrey was um, the main speaker apparently was described as the voice of the vestry so there were, there were companies like E. EEBO and ProQuest who are keeping these ancient documents alive and bringing them back into print. So yes, I, I did use quite a lot of websites for the second novel. And, and were, were they sort of in their original state, which reading 17th century writing is quite a challenge, or at some kind so beautifully transcribed them? And, and, and like Sue was saying, you know, she, her later notes, they were all beautifully typed. Of course, in the Regency period, the typewriter hadn't been invented, which was very inconsiderate. Um, the, the books that I ordered, Early English Books Online, EEBO, 
those were exactly as they'd been written and you needed to have a sort of rectangle with a, with a hole centred through it so you can follow the writing <laughs> and, and read exactly what it said. So they are extant and the trials, the, the trials um, that I read, they're quite shocking. But uh, no, nobody's edited anything out that, uh, that they might have done. So yes, they were as they were. Thank you. Are you happy um, to share those websites afterwards if anybody wants to? Yes, write them down? yes, I've got them. As I possibly here. may just want to yes. do so. Thank you. So um, you've talked about using books and boxes and and being very organised with your charts. Are, are you a, a fan of specific websites or? Uh, definitely yes. There's yeah. some very good ones out there. Um, I just. You know, really impressed by the amount of um, websites and other things that uh, Marjorie has consulted, and you only need to look at her bibliography at the end of the book to see how much work has gone in to the background for the story. Um, and just just to say, you know, that I think uh, if you've ever done a presentation that you've had to prepare, or or, or written something about anything really. Um, there is a, a, a rule that for every minute of your presentation, there's 60 minutes preparation. And I think that is so true, that kind of proportion for, for writing, um, particularly a historical novel, where the reader will want a certain amount of accuracy. And you have to rely on these websites for giving you um, that accuracy, I suppose. I do use Wikipedia, but um, it does vary in terms of who's done the entry, so whether it's reliable or not. But it usually has a really good list of books at the end, and I often take those down and, and follow them up. In terms of my Boa War um, story, um, I very much, in this book, focus on the medical side of the Boa War, the volunteer doctors that went out, and, and nurses with the Red Cross, and I think um, Queen Mary's uh, army auxiliaries were, were out there as well. Um, and um, I came across, and it's still going, I checked up uh, yesterday, uh, a website called um, angloboawar.com, and it's an enthusiast who's been running this website for years, and it's just got about everything you could wish to know about the Boer War on it, including the list of requisition ships that carried the horses and the troops back and forth. Um, half a million horses were sent out to the Boer War, um, which was pretty dire. Um, 13,000 of them didn't quite make it. They died on the ship on the way, of course. Uh, it was a cruel time. We, we know about that with war horse in the First World War, but it was very bad in the Boer War as well. Um, the medical side, um, British Medical Journal, BMJ, has got archives that are accessible um, I think it's bnj.com forward slash archives. Um, so you can read some reports by medical staff that are out there. And the Royal College of Nursing has an archive that goes back as well. rcnarchive.rcn.org.uk, if that's still the right address. Um, and it was really interesting because you had nurses who were serving out there writing articles that were published um, back home for, for people to read. Um, what else? Parliament, um, there's a Hansard archive, hansard.gov.uk, um, which used to have a really good index on it, so if you wanted to see um, what um, a particular MP had said about something, you could, you could um, look them up and it would come up with precisely the dates on which they'd spoken on a particular thing. Um, something's gone wrong with their search archive and it's not nearly as good so I don't use it very often. The really good resource, which I don't think I mentioned here, no, um, for 19th century and to a certain extent the 18th century is the British Newspaper Archive. It's a British Library facility, it's a subscription service but you can work it from home, it's got a brilliant index um, it's got loads of newspapers on there, but it hasn't got the Times or the Guardian or some of the other classy <laughs> jobs. <laughs> but it has got um, quite a wide range of papers there. 
uh, and the index works really well, um, and it costs about £70 a year, something like that. But I use that a lot, because it may not give me the truth, because sometimes um, reports in newspapers are not true. Surely they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but it does give you the flavour of authenticity of what was going on at the time, and authenticity is not equal truth, of course. It sometimes does, but um, uh, I found that very useful. Um, in terms of uh, Regency, because I, 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 I vowed I'd never touch Regency, and then Covid came, and I read my first Georgia Hayer, never having read them as a teenager, and I read something she said about, because um, uh, she lived during the Second World War and the Blitz, um, if she had to go down the air raid shelter for the night, she'd take one of her own books with her, because she wanted a good comfort read. So, um, so I thought, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have a go, um, and so I did, and I've, I've written quite a lot of them. And now, um, using various sources, I have got a resource document of my own, which must run to about 50 pages on the computer, uh, and is indexed, um, and so I can look up anything that I've forgotten. Like, how on earth did they stop those carriages going too fast downhill? Uh, I didn't know, and then I had to research that and find out because I want, you know. And um, how um, uh, one of my characters had given an instruction, I'd written down an address in pencil on a bit of paper for them to memorise, and they were told to rub it out afterwards. And I thought, how did they rub something out in 1818? Because there wasn't vulcanised rubber in apparently until 1838 or something. Um, well, they use candle wax, soft, slightly soft candle, apparently. So there you go. So I have to learn something every day. So I, I think when you go in, in your back into history, you're forever having to delve into sources of information that give your writing um, a, an authentic context. Um, uh, that being said, it's quite interesting that sometimes you don't get it right. Um, so I was told off, but um, I discovered that there was a thing called a children's ball. They prepared their aristocratic young ladies and gents for the grown-up stuff by having a children's ball um, during the social season in London. Um, and I described the young gentleman, who would be about 13 or 14 years old, as wearing gaiters. Because I thought those satin things that had buttons up the side were called gaiters. And apparently they're great clomping leather things that you... <laughs> Where were you going outside? And this particular reader gave me a review in which she said, oh, I quite enjoyed this book. I do need to point out that they wouldn't have gone to a ball wearing gaiters. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, Marjorie and I belong to the same book group back in Settle, and um, we recently uh, discussed uh, Robert Harris's Act of Oblivion. Um, and uh, apparently in that he mentions two things that he shouldn't have mentioned. One was rhododendrons in England, but apparently they weren't in 1600 and whatever. Yeah. And the other was, um, oh, the use of a lead pencil, they weren't invented then. <laughs> so there you go. So, you know, not even those bestsellers get it right at the time. <laughs> I think there's hope for all of us, really. Yeah, yeah. Robert Harris can get it wrong. <laughs> hey. So, um, so I think Sue, so, as you've got the as you've got the microphone there, why not? I mean, you 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 said that the reason you started doing your your book book on the book Balmer War was because of the lady Lucy Dean, was it? And the, you Lucy showed, Dean. Yeah. Lucy Dean. She was your in, inspiration for the whole process, if you, if you like. But have you ever sat back and thought, well, I'm really, really interested, because I know your books do span best about the 100 years. But you think, I'm really interested in that period, so I'm going to write a book about it and then do the research. Or does the research always come first for you? I think sometimes the inspirations or the ideas emerge from the research you're doing. Um, and certainly, in, in terms of Lucy Dean, um, because of the journey I'd started on of uh, investigating the committee of ladies that went out to South Africa, and I then found that there was one that went out to the Western Front, I then um, investigated that a bit more. And it led me to a lady called Mrs. Vi uh, Violet Markham, 
who was working with Lucy Dean on the WAC Commission, as it got called, the French one. Um, and uh, I uh, then thought, well, let's find out a bit more about Mrs. Markham. How I can meet another. So I found that, that Violet Markham, uh, who she's an interesting lady in herself, but I won't get diverted. Um, she she actually um, uh, had uh, a commitment, I suppose, to keeping in touch with people, and she wrote so many letters. She's got a file of her letters at the um, Women's Library at the London School of Economics. So I ended up staying with my daughter, I think, in her flat, and spending several days at the LSE going through this correspondence file. And um, I suddenly came across a really odd letter. Um, it was uh, written in beautiful, bold copper plate in purple ink. And it was very easy to read, uh, quite big writing, so quite a few pages of it. And it was this lady called Violet, um, which is possibly why she wrote in Violet Ink, pouring out her heart about why has this happened to me? Um, uh, and she was asking Mrs. Markham, I do not understand. They asked me to do this job and now they have sacked me after six weeks. Um, and I thought, what's going on here? Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to find out. And so I started on a nine-year journey of investigating a lady called Violet Douglas Pennant, who in 1918, quite close to the end of the uh, First World War, was, was appointed woman commandant of the Women's Royal Air Force, which had just been created along with the male bits, the RAF. Um, and they wanted an aristocratic lady to run, uh, run the thing and they tried one and she, she'd been sacked and then they tried Violet Douglas Pennant and she was sacked. The first one had gone quietly but Violet didn't. And um, I had great fun and considerable frustration um, investigating what had gone on, who were the other characters involved. And it's the book I'm actually going to leave with Harrogate Library, which is a political biography, really, uh, The Rise and Fall of Violet Douglas Pennant. Uh, so that was my big diversion. Um, Nine years is quite a significant <laughs> diversion. Uh, and even then I wasn't finished. You know how you, you get in something and you say, I haven't done enough here. But um, I got to August 1918, which was the 100th year anniversary of her sacking, and I thought this would be an appropriate time for publication, so, um, so I duly did. Um, so that was one where I, uh, yeah, the idea emerged from something I was already doing, but then I set out, like, real, with real determination to try and find out. Um, I just, I won't go on any more about it, except to say that um, she had a connection with um, Penryn Castle in, uh, in North Wales. Um, she was the son of the second Baron Penryn, Penryn Castle. Um, and uh, the Welsh people were very supportive of her when this sacking happened. But I suspect um, the British government wanted to hush it all up. And one of the things I had to try and find was a uh, verbatim report of uh, an investigation with witnesses and, in and so on in interrogations um, that had been done at the time. Could I find it? National Records Office? No. British Library? No. In the end, the only copy I found was in the National Library of Wales. <laughs> Boy, it's not surprising. And now they have digitalised it, so it's now there for posterity. But it is a, it's a very, very, um, well, read it if you like to. <laughs> I, won't find, I can't find the adjectives to describe how Violet Douglas Pennant was treated. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Now, Marjorie, just just follow that. So, but sen sensibly and seriously, were you researching for, for you know just out for pleasure, if dare I use that word, or did you have these stories sort of bugging you, and you, and you decided you wanted to get them out there? I started writing both of my novels from the information I gained from the fact that I'd already read, for example, 
biographies about Anne Boleyn and I'd already read Samuel Pepys' diaries. But when I came to be writing um, this one, Mayflowers for November, I got Blanche Parry as a young girl who she was the, the rocker for Queen Elizabeth Princess Elizabeth she was then for her cradle and so I thought well I'd better just look into this and see how old she was and, it, it, and I read Ruth Norrington's biography of Blanche Parry and it, it was very interesting and she was definitely this lady was a lot older than, uh, than I had written her in my book so I had to change it um, but it, it, it was relatively easy to, to make a change like that and she, and she had a, a slightly bigger part in the novel because she, she followed through with my imagined character, Avis, through her life story as well. Um, for Mr Pepys, I followed up the diaries by reading around the period and um, I came across the strange death of Edmund Godfrey and I thought, oh, do I want to write about I was we're going to write about um, Samuel Pepys from his wife's point of view but uh, I thought oh I think I'm going to have to write about this murder and see if I can investigate it and find out what happened so um, it, another factor stopped me from writing from from Samuel Pepys's wife's point of view because when he actually dis she actually discovered um, <laughs> Her husband Samuel with the maid, Deb, young girl who used to comb his hair, that was her job because wearing a wig you see, when you've got your wig off you need your hair combing and um, let's just say he had, he had quite wandering hands <laughs> when his wife walked in and the effect of that upon their marriage was that his chief steward, uh, his chief clerk to ended up doing a load of marriage guidance counselling and poor Elizabeth Pepys in my opinion, from what I read about in his diary, Samuel Pepys tells you everything, the poor lady had a nervous breakdown. And I thought, how can I write a story about Samuel Pepys from his wife's point of view? Because she was so upset about this incident with the maid. It was so obvious to me that she didn't know about Mrs Bagwell. <laughs> and Mrs Bag Bagwell was the wife of Mr Bagwell, who was a ship's carpenter. And Mr. Bagwell and Mrs. Bagwell, between them, decided um, that if he could bribe Mr. Pepys, shall we say, in kind, to get him some work on the ships, and that's what he did. So there was Mr. Bagwell sitting in one room, and there was um, Samuel Pepys with his wife in another room, and we don't need to say what hanky panky was going on there. But, <laughs> But uh, certainly, um, Mr. Bagwell got some um, <laughs> got some work to do on the ships because Samuel Pepys was um, Secretary of the Naval Office. Okay, thank you, Sue. Well, well, I, I think obviously, I mean, Mrs. Pepys. Come on, you've got to give her a, a voice. I, I've long time since I've read his diaries. But I always felt very sorry for her. I think he put on her a great deal, yes. and he was very unfaithful given the chance. So. <laughs> He wasn't the pillar of respectability he liked to pretend. So perhaps that could be your next <laughs> project. <laughs> so, um, and you've already started started sort of mentioning it. it it's, it's the byways, isn't it, that make research so interesting because you start very, oh, I'm going to read this, and then you go, oh, well, who would have thought it? But what, so you see, what's the most unexpected fact you've ever found in your research? Oh, one or two even. Um, well, I was focusing on this particular book, and I think I probably already mentioned um, um, some of them. Uh, the WAC Commission itself, the fact that the British government in the last closing months of the, of the war would send this, these five women out to interview uh, everyone except the nurses that were being accused of this behaviour, uh, inter interviewed all the top knobs. Um, uh, and in the end, said there was no case to answer, but uh, whether it was a, you know, put up job, I don't know. Um, but during the Boer War, I was quite surprised to find that um, the Daily Mail had a circulation of over a million. 
and uh, the journalist was out there with his camera taking pictures. And I didn't realise that uh, we had that kind of mass popular journalism at that point. Um, and the horses, I hadn't realised how drastic the, the thing with the horses was. Um, yes. And you can't imagine, I mean, it must have been terrible, hard enough for the soldiers being shipped out there. They knew what they were going to. But the ships of the time, which were very small, I mean, what it must have been like for the horses stuck in these ships with all the, you know, the weather, there's no air conditioning, it would have been stifling hot when they went across the equator. Oh, yeah. It must have been dreadful for yeah. them. Well, there had been plenty of work for Mr. Bagley. Was it Mr. Bagley? Because they used to fit out these ships with all these um, compartments, and the horses, were, I think, would be harnessed. So like the a stable. Sort of falling over, and they'd have their bucket of water and their, their feed, you know. And so they designed these ships, you know, to give them first-class hotel accommodation <laughs> all the way to South Africa. Except for the odd body they had to drop over the side because it died on the way. Um, yes. Amazing that any of them actually survived the, the trip, it was a long trip, well, but also were, yeah. were fit for, mm. for war purposes. Yeah. I mean, something like, I kind of knew, but then looked at with new eyes, was um, if you ever look around old churches that have got a Boer War Memorial and a First World War Memorial, they're usually very different. The Boer War one is usually very ornate, um, and it, it has killed in action at the top, you know, and about half a dozen names. Died of disease, about four times as many names, you know. Um, and uh, I suppose one shouldn't be, be shocked that the, the, the British Army, I mean, I don't think it was very well managed, to be honest, but I've recently done um, research into the Crimean War, and nursing particularly in the Crimean War, and it was precisely the same. They sent out all these horses and they died. Um, and the men got typhus and died, um, and uh, they, they held off hostilities during the winter because it was just too awful to do anything. Um, ended up eating the horses, of course, because they hadn't any food left, and oh, it was dire, it really was. So, um, yeah, and I think uh, uh, I did look at uh, the, um, you know, the comparison with the First World War, which was in around 1880, which is much shorter, but uh, with, with the Second World the Second World War and then the First World War, there was this kind of you almost sense that it was like building up for the for the war against Germany, because in in South Africa, certainly in the nineteen hundred one, they were fighting um, the Boer. Um, guerrillas, as they were called, who were using German Mauser pistols, uh, rifles, which were much, much um, more accurate and longer distance than the British equivalent. And of course, they sued for peace in uh, about the end of 2000, uh, 1902, I think, because just like in 1981, they couldn't win. Uh, they couldn't win against this kind of warfare. Um, so it shouldn't be, a, it's not a surprise, really, but history does repeat itself. You know, don't we all the time? I mean, yes. you still are. <laughs> yeah. And Marjorie, you know, moving on to your books, and the, um, I don't know, the yeah, quite, quite yeah. long and, and often seen as very distinct periods. But did you find out anything while you were doing your research that completely flawed you or was totally unexpected? <laughs> yes, I did. I discovered that the novel was writing itself. <laughs> this is what happened. Um, I'd been reading Peter Ackroyd, you know Peter Ackroyd, yeah. he writes history novels and he, he also writes history um, text, you know, non-fiction. And I'd read Thames, Sacred River, and I was absolutely blown over by this book because it was so fascinating. And he, he was writing about the watermen and all their superstitions, etc, etc. And I decided that my imagined character, Avis, was going to be married to a waterman. So um, Avis has got a problem and she's worried, she's pregnant and she wants to go and visit a wise woman. So I'll just read you a little paragraph about um, what happened. Uh, she, she persuaded her husband against his better nature to take her to visit this wise woman. So she says, 
this wise woman lives near the Thames, near the shrine to St Augustus of Hippo. So she, I write in, the, in Avis's words, I tread upon old stone steps worn away at their centres through hundreds of years of pilgrim footsteps. Time shrinks. I could be the first traveller to cross this bridge or the last. Over the centuries the feeling is the same. The expectation that something mystical will happen, the hope of becoming closer to God, of being blessed, of finding peace and promise for the future. And I thought to myself, after I'd written that, I thought, oh, I'd better research this St Augustus of Hippo. And I did. And I read of St Augustine walking up a flight of stairs and entering the vast meadows of memory. And this was eerie because it's what I'd just written was going on in the mind of my imagined character just as I say, as if the novel was writing itself. Um, and when you um, were, were particularly your Anne Boleyn... Yeah, this uh, is the Anne Boleyn, the Anne yes. Boleyn novel. And, and I was very interested because you write it from, from a, basically a servant girl, which is yes. slightly unusual. Anne Boleyn, they usually focus on her relationships, Henry VIII and all the rest of it. Did you find that easy to research, you know, the, the jobs that, that went with the, the royal couple? No, no, because uh, I, I, I think I've mentioned before, I've got um, lots and lots of, of information of everyday life, yeah, yeah. of everyday life from Alison Sim um, and Lisa Picard. So everything I needed to know about that. And then also, um, there's vast biography, autobiography in the back yeah. and lots and lots and lots of information about Henry VIII and his court and his wives and his ministers etc etc. And has anybody else, do you, do you know, because uh, has anybody else written from a, a sort of servant's perspective in the court or, or are you the first? I think, I, I've not read anything written no, by... No, I'm not aware of it. I think there is another book. I had a washerwoman um, in mine, uh, a laundry lady, and I think there's another book. Is it by Susanna Liscombe? I'm not sure. But there's another. Uh, there was a novel when I was trying to get an agent. There was a novel out which had a, a, a laundry lady in it. So um, you know, I was said, they said no, thank you. But we've already got. You've already got one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A way you've got the microphone, I suppose one of the things I, I, I've got from you today is the sheer amount of research, how you work so hard to make whatever's in your books, to make it right, or, or as right as you can do when you're delving in, into history. But just a little question, we have the facts, do you ever bend them in your books? <laughs> Marjorie? Um, well... <laughs> One piece of research I was slow to read was um, primary evidence from Roger Lestrange, who was a sort of self-appointed detective kind of person, journalist, who after, this is from my Mr Peeps novel, after Edmund Godfrey had been found dead and three men were executed for his murder, who were innocent research they, they pretty much were innocent there was an, and after um you see the the men who were executed were catholics and this was in the time of the popish plot when you only had to say you were a catholic and you were there and lord chief justice scrubs would think oh well he or she is a catholic so of course they did it that was ter terrible prejudice against the catholics so these three men who were executed were Catholics. Now this fellow called Roger Lestrange decided to go about his own research. And after Charles II died, he, he had lots of children, but none of them with his wife, so they couldn't inherit the throne. So his brother James II, as you probably know, became king. And James II was a Catholic, you know, he came out as a Catholic at a time when he shouldn't, you know, it, it was best if he hadn't, but he did and he didn't last very long, but during the reign of James II, 
Roger Lestrange took it upon himself to do some investigations and he interviewed lots of people who'd seen Edmund Godfrey and said they'd seen Edmund Godfrey um, on his last day. And some people said, well, there was a very tall man in black at Primrose Hill, which is where the body was found. Uh, and you couldn't be sure whether that really was him or just some other person dressed in black who happened to be very tall. But I was writing my solution to the murder of Edwin Godfrey um, when it occurred to me that if, if you know anything about this period, there's the most atrocious liar history has ever known, Titus Oates, and he pretended there was a popish plot. And he got himself involved giving evidence and, and, and other people giving evidence about the, the death of this man and who was standing by the dead body and everything. So, um, the, Queen Henrietta Maria, who was King Charles I's wife, was a Catholic and she brought her sons up as Catholic and her daughters uh, and she was given Somerset House. So Somerset House in London was associated with the Catholics and I thought oh well this is why Titus Soaps is saying all these things are happening at, at Somerset House you know it's nothing to do with the murder. And at first I wasn't willing to read Roger Lestrange's investigations because I'd read um, Alan Marshall's biography and others and they said he started with the premise that uh, Edmund Godfrey uh, committed suicide and his brothers made it look like murder to, uh, to save the estate from going to the Crown. So um, I, th I was always worried about that because I thought he had two brothers and that one was a magistrate, the other was, I don't, I've forgotten. But they were gentlemen, and I thought, how could they live with themselves watching those three men hang for a murder when what had really happened was perhaps that he committed suicide? So um, all these things were going through my head, and then I thought, well, I'd better read what this Roger that a stranger's found. And he interviewed Edmund Godfrey's next door neighbour's servant. And Edmund Godfrey's next door neighbour's servant had been standing on the steps of Somerset House on Edmund Godfrey's last hours. And he saw Edmund Godfrey talking to some men at Somerset House. <coughs> Until then I thought my solution was going to be that Edmund Godfrey walked to Primrose Hill, which he did, and he walked back. But he walked again and that we died there. And it suddenly became very obvious to me then that the last people to see Edmund Godfrey alive were these three men who were standing around him on Primrose Hill. And this servant actually acknowledged Edmund Godfrey. He said, hello, Sir Edmund. And Sir Edmund replied. So, you know, they did know each other. And that seemed to me to set the scene that something did happen at Somerset House. You know, and if I hadn't read that bit of first-hand primary extant evidence, you know, I wouldn't have known that. So, um, it was wrong of me to say I'm not going to read this man because he's presuming it's um, suicide disguised as murder. But, um, yes, yeah, so the question was about... The, did, did, I did, did, you, did you sort of twist the facts to fit your fiction? Uh, the, well, yes, because I'm waffling on about Roger Lewis Strange. <laughs> what I did do was, my, I got Samuel Pepys as a protagonist and Edwin Godfrey as a protagonist. So I thought, I can't introduce Roger Lewis Strange now as a new character. I mean, I had to get rid of 20,000 words. <laughs> it was so, so I thought, I know what Samuel Pepys is like. I've read his diaries. If you were going on the, the London to Brighton coach, and you thought, well, I've got this good book to read. If Samuel Pepys got in, you won't get a chance because he wouldn't stop talking. And I thought Samuel Pepys was accused of actually orchestrating this murder. His, and his clerk was tried for actually standing by the body and arranging for the, you know, having been present at the death and doing that for Samuel Pepys. But uh, it's just what a strange situation really to find yourself in as a writer that you've got this other information so i thought right samuel pepys would definitely have been at that trial of those three men 
and at that trial of his own servant Sam. And he would have maybe been wandering around London asking questions. So maybe, maybe he did talk to Edmund Godfrey's neighbours because this, this servant living next door to Edmund Godfrey had kept silent about the fact that he'd seen Sir Edmund on that day because he was scared stiff that they were Catholics and they were going to murder him. You know, so, so it's a very complicated, very complicated situation, really. So I had Samuel Pepys interviewing the people who Roger Lestrange had interviewed. And so Roger Lestrange's information came to the readers through Samuel Pepys. But he does strike me as the sort of person who wouldn't sit back and do nothing. The, the, the thing is, if his clerk, Samuel, if Samuel Pepys Clark, young Sam, had behaved himself <clears throat> and stayed at the office and done the work while Samuel Pepys went off to Newmarket with King Charles II and his brother James, if, if the clerk had stayed at home, he would have been found guilty of the murder and Samuel Pepys would have suffered as well. I mean, we was doing it for Sam. Samuel Pepys would probably have lost his life as well. But what happened was young Sam had got two gentle, two lady friends who decided that they wanted to look round a ship. So off goes young Sam to this Captain Vittles who he knows. And he gets drunk on Captain Vittles' ship. And the night when he was supposed to be standing by the body, the dead body at Somerset House, young Sam <laughs> is sitting in a boat with um, Captain Vittles' boatman. And they're having to wait for the tides before they can get across um, and across the Thames and everything. So it was that that saved them all. That and the fact that Charles II had invited um, <laughs> Samuel Pepys to go to the races with him. So, so um, am I getting off the point? I used Roger Lestrange's evidence to, and put it in the mouth of Samuel Pepys. <laughs> I think under circumstances that was perfectly acceptable and it's also nice to know that nothing's changed it? the boss is away the mice will play but in this case it was a very very well worth it yes. Sue, you, you sort of nodded when we asked about yeah. uh, twisting end facts it, yeah, end it like Beckham hey yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah I, I think I, I, I asked the question you know, what if and I got my historical context and maybe particular situations going back to um, Miss Deacon investigates. There are two levels at which Miss Deacon is investigating in this story. That's, um, one is the official investigation, uh, interviewing people along the Western Front to find out about the behaviour of the wax. Um, the second, which is the main part of the story really, is that in the course of visiting uh, one of the um, frontline hospitals, she um, talks to a dying soldier um, who was on a ship out to South Africa for the Boer War, who um, rem reminisces and, and says that a particular doctor and nurse saved his life because he was a stowaway and they looked after him when he was sick and didn't report him. Um, and what, he wonders what had happened to them. So she sets out to find out what happened to this doctor and nurse. She's got the names um, and by the end of the story, she has done and how i got the idea for this particular doctor was that among all the papers about the boer war that the um, enthusiast with his anglo boer war website had set out was what happened to the volunteer veterinary surgeons and doctors who went out to to you know look after the troops and at the end of the conflict only one volunteer doctor was listed as missing in action well, we know what that means, usually, doesn't it? But in my case, I decided, no, he hadn't died. There was a reason why he didn't want to show himself at the end of the war. He went into hiding. So I then built a story around that idea and why that might have happened. Um, I had great fun doing it. Um, but yes, I often take real situations and change them around by saying, what if? Um, I'll give you another example from the Victorian age, um, 1890 I think, um, there was a scandal called the Tranby Croft Scandal when the Prince of Wales uh, 
the son of um, Queen Victoria, was present at a Baccarat uh, gambling session at a private house. You were allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to go to clubs and gamble in those days. Um, and it led to the Prince of Wales being called as a witness because uh, one of the number was cheating. Um, and in the end, uh, they had various people coming to court to testify and in the end he was fined, I think, because he was found guilty. So in my story, uh, which is one of my um, Victorian kind of, I suppose, scandal stories, um, there was a, an occasion like that, but when it came to court, everyone except one person decided to say that the man was innocent, not guilty. Um, and there was a reason for that. You know, there was a reason for that which was to do with the behaviour of the host of, of the event. Uh, I entirely made up, but um, it was quite good fun doing it. And, and I think, you know, you're, as the author, you're in charge. You know, so you can make what happen, what, happen, what you want to make happen. Um, and you can change history as long as you're not claiming to write some kind of scientific account. You know, you can use your imagination. And uh, that's, you know, quite good fun to do sometimes. I enjoy it anyway. Yes. Well, um, I, won't, I, I, I was going to ask you, um, sort of, um, I'm conscious of time, we're coming, coming to the end. But just briefly, um, why do you think, and it's lovely to see you all here today, why do you think historical fiction attracts readers so much? Um, what well, do you Yeah, I say. Quick answer if you can, because I've got one more question to ask you, and then I might let everybody else ask you questions. Well, um, I think people read novels because they want to go into another world, and history gives you the opportunity to do that because you're going into a, a real world that was in the past. So, it, I mean, it is what it is, isn't it? It's history, but it's fiction and it's, in, it's a lot of imagination. So um, I think we are inspired by characters from history, like uh, Henry VIII and uh, Florence Nightingale, or whoever, you know, if, we, if we're fascinated by those characters, we want to read more about them and try and get into their world. Yeah. Okay. So why do you think you know, historical fiction is so popular? Well, um, generally, I think um, any writing is done, uh, it's been said, to educate and to entertain. And I think uh, historical fiction um, perhaps does more of the educating than, than other fiction because it might be focusing on a particular period, but it also entertains, maybe there's a bit of nostalgia there, um, and uh, maybe um, uh, escapism. Um, taking you into another world, a world that has got no computer screens, sometimes no telephone, sometimes no automobile, handwritten letters, you know, that is nostalgic stuff, isn't it now? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and while you're there, my, my, probably my final question for you is, what are you working on at the moment? Well, there's a fun question. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of other stuff other than researching and writing at the moment, but um, in terms of uh, what I've got simmering in the background, if you like, I recently did a couple of nostalgia visits with my husband, who was celebrating a very significant birthday, and we went to the town where he grew up until he, was, until he went away to university, which is Beaudley in Worcestershire, beautiful little Georgian town. Um, and before we went, we did a little bit of homework. We visited the house where he used to live, and it's flat now. Um, but the lady in the top of that let us in, so we saw his bedroom. Oh, amazing! Um, uh, and uh, we also had um, uh, a local anti-racism group had got this really neat tour of the town, talking about the merchants who were around in the 1700s, bringing goods up in their special sailing barges from Bristol, including rum, sugar, um, etc. You know, obviously products, and some of the merchants were also slave owners. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking of possibly doing something around that 
probably 1700s, which would be a new period to me. I have to have a consultant to help me. <laughs> and the other thing was we visited, which I think might come first actually, we visited where he went to this private prep school, south of Bath, a place called Beckington. And the school was in uh, a building that's now 400 years old. Amazing Elizabethan solid, uh, looks like a fortress. It's called Beckington Castle. And uh, we were actually allowed to go round and have a look at it so he could see the sick room where he almost died of viral pneumonia <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, where the classrooms were. It's, it's actually a couple of offices now. But we were told that um, one of the cleaners had seen a ghost. So that would be a new venture for me. And I think a 400 year old building has got plenty of potential for that. So um, I'm thinking of writing a ghost story. Oh. <laughs> That's next month when we do spooky stories and Halloween. Yeah. All right, I'll have to come along. <laughs> Please do, Marjorie. Uh, I'm having a total change. After writing two novels where most of the majority of the characters, if not all, were real historical people, I promised myself that I would write the next novel with uh, imagined characters throughout. I'm thinking it would be. Um, thinking it would be a lot simpler but in fact it's more difficult because I haven't got the research to inspire the plot but my novel is called um, Ode to Gina and uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy comes into it but it's in, it was inspired by a postcard photograph that I bought it, it so long ago I can't remember whether I bought it in an antique shop in Wales or in Shropshire or in Haworth but it's a photograph of a mother and father and a pair of twins in a pram and a, a, a young lad sitting at the base. It's a, it's a family photograph. I don't know who it is, but I've, I've got a story in my head about it. And one of the, it's a family saga where one of the twins is long lost and the grandmother in the story is, one of, is the, the twin who's lost her other sister and she wants to find out what happened to her because she disappeared when she was 10. And there is also another main character, it's in two, two timelines, because it goes back to Victorian England, but it also starts um, round about um, the time in, I, would, I grew up in Coventry, it's set in Coventry, and it starts more or less with the consecration of the new Coventry Cathedral. So uh, that's what I'm working on. Thank you. Yes. I think there could be a good collaboration here, sharing research, as, you, as you're just sort of swapping periods, really. Yes. So, mm. um, thank you very much. Before we finish, has anybody got any questions for either Sue or Marjorie? I'd like to know how they did slow the coach down going down. <laughs> <laughs> you said you wanted to know how they slowed the coach down. Oh, right, the yes, coach yes. when it was going downhill. You wanted to find out, we did find out, yes. so now I want to find out. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember? Um, I've forgotten what it's called, you know. I think someone was going to ask this and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's to do with them, they used to have postillions often, if it was a six horse carriage, you know, a big yeah. one, they would, they would have a lad riding on the front horse to have to steer them around. And he would have to jump down and go to the wheel, I think the back wheel, and there was a special wooden thing, which has got a name, which I can't remember. Like a chop, then. That idea, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so it slowed the turning of the wheel. Ah. And he had to stand on it, I think. It sounds pretty hairy, actually. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Ah, right, thank you. Um, thank you. Just one thing, which book it's in. Um, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Positive education today. Uh, Can we come back to it and see if you have inspiration? Oh, okay, the book and you can find out. I can't remember. It's one of the Regency ones. Okay. Has anybody got any other questions? Yeah, hi. There's a Peace Museum in London just off uh, Fleet Street. Uh, do you ever go to places like the actual houses he lived in or things like that? You mean Edmund Godfrey? Or oh, Samuel Pepys? Samuel Pepys, yes. You can actually go around the house. Oh, no, I haven't. I didn't know. Yeah, it's just off Fleet Street. Yes, I've, I've done the part of the walk that Edmund Godfrey would have done from his home 
um, up St. Martin's Lane and beyond, just to prove that uh, if anybody ever said that he couldn't have walked all the way to Primrose Hill, because he was only 50 something at that time, and I was older than that, and I could have done it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, thank you. Near St. Olaf's Church. Huh? By the Tower of London, near St. Olaf's Church. No, no, it's in Fleet Street. In Fleet Street. The newspapers you see published. Oh, yes. And there's, a, there's an old pub there called the Cheshire Cat. Oh, right. And that's just a side Oh, right, because he, he lived in the naval offices. Yes. Oh, I'll, 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 next time I go to London, I'll have a look. Thank you for that information. Okay. Right, I'm very conscious of time, so if I may, can I thank Marjorie and Sue for coming, coming from Settle, so they've had a bit of a trek, and thank them for their time. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Feel free to come up and ask some awkward questions. That's fine. <laughs>